Progressive Stages of Meditation on Emptiness, by Venkenpo Tsultrim Jiamso Rinpoche, translated and arranged by Shenpen Hook M. Stage 5, The Emptiness of Other, Shentong, Approach. As was mentioned in the last section, many Shentong masters criticize the Prasangika Madhyamikas for their claim that they do not hold any views. In the opinion of these masters, Prasangikas just dodge the issue because they refute everyone else's views and then avoid the refutation of their own views by claiming not to have any. From the Shentong point of view, the fault with both Svatantrika and Prasangika Madhyamaka is that they do not distinguish between the three different kinds of existence, the three different kinds of emptiness and the three different kinds of absence of essence that correspond to the three natures, i.e. the imaginary dependent and perfect existence. Some Shentong masters argue that Rangtong Madhyamaka teaches only the first kind of emptiness, in other words, the emptiness of the imaginary nature, which is simply its complete non-existence. They argue that if this kind of emptiness were the absolute reality or if mere absence of conceptual contrivance were absolute reality it would be a mere nothingness, empty space. How can mere nothingness account for the manifestations of samsara and nirvana? They appear vividly as impure and pure manifestations respectively. Mere emptiness does not account for this. There has to be some element that is in some sense luminous, illuminating and knowing. Because Shentong makes the same distinction between the three natures as the Sittama trends do, and because it stresses the true existence of the luminous knowing aspect of mind, many Rangtong masters have confused it with Sittamatra. However, there are very important differences between Sittamatra and Shentong. Firstly Shentong does not accept the Sittamatra view that consciousness is truly existent. They hold the Madhyamaka view that it is non-arising and without self-nature. They consider themselves to be the great Madhyamikas because their system involves not only recognizing freedom from all conceptual contrivance, but also the realization of the wisdom mind Gnana, that is free from all conceptual contrivance. This non-conceptual wisdom mind is not the object of the conceptualizing process and so is not negated by Madhyamaka reasoning. Therefore, it can be said to be the only thing that has absolute and true existence. It is important to understand that this true existence does not mean that it can be conceptualized. If it were even the most subtle object of the conceptual process, it could be refuted by prasangika reasoning. The non-conceptual wisdom mind is not something that even supreme wisdom, prajna, can take as its object. Anything that can be an object of consciousness, however pure and refined, is dependently arising and has no true existence. So what is the non-conceptual wisdom mind? It is something that one realizes through means other than the conceptual process. One experiences it directly just as it is and any conceptual fabrication obscures it. All the teachings of Mahamudra and Mahaati and the whole of the tantras are about this non-conceptual wisdom mind and the means of realizing it. For this realization a guru is absolutely necessary. His realization and the disciple's devotion and openness of mind have to meet in such a way that the disciple can experience that non-conceptual wisdom mind directly. From then on he uses that experience as the basis of his practice, nurturing, and fostering it until it becomes clear and stable. Only then can the final, full, and perfect realization occur. From the Shentong point of view, what the Sittamatrans call absolute i.e. the experience of the self-knowing, self-illuminating awareness, is wrongly interpreted by them to be a consciousness, Vijnana. Shentong says that although it is true that when the mind rests in emptiness without conceptual contrivance, which all Mahayanists claim to do, one does experience the clear luminosity and aware quality of mind, this is not a consciousness, Vijnana. Vijnana means a divided consciousness, in other words divided into a seeing and seen aspect. Shentong takes it as a fact that a mind bounded by concepts of time and space must in some sense entertain the concepts of moments having duration and atoms with extension in space. Furthermore, it will always seem that for an instant of knowing to take place, a knowing and a known aspect of consciousness must arise even if it is understood that they have no ultimate or real existence. The Shentong regards the concept of a stream of consciousness consisting of moments having knowing and known aspects as a misunderstanding of reality. 
it is a false or deceptive reality or truth. In fact the term relative truth we have been using throughout this text is a translation of the Sanskrit word, Samvriti, which means covered or concealed, the Tibetan translation, Kunradzab, means dressed up or blown up to give a false appearance. One could say Samvriti is mere concealment, Samvriti. In a certain sense it is not reality or truth at all, but merely a seeming reality. It is only relatively true in the sense that things seem to be that way to ordinary beings. Ultimately it is not true at all. From the Shentong point of view, the luminous self-aware non-conceptual mind that is experienced in meditation, when the mind is completely free from concepts, is absolute reality and not a vijnana. Vijnana is always samvriti from the Shentong point of view and is not what is found by the supreme wisdom, prajna, that sees absolute reality. When the luminous, self-aware, non-conceptual mind that is the wisdom mind Jnana, is realized by the supreme wisdom, prajna, there is no seeing and seen aspect, no realizing and realized aspect to the realization. This is called the transcendence of supreme wisdom, prajna paramita. It is none other than the non-conceptual wisdom mind Jnana, itself. It is also called the non-dual wisdom mind Anana, the clear light, Prabhasvara, nature of mind and Datu, spacious expanse or element. Elsewhere it is called Datu and awareness inseparable clarity and emptiness inseparable bliss and emptiness inseparable. It is also called the Dharmata and the Tathagata Garbha. The Shentong contention is that the experience of complete freedom from conceptual contrivance, Nisprapanka, must also be the experience of the clear light nature of mind. In their opinion a prasangika who denies this must still have some subtle concept which is obscuring or negating this reality, in other words he has not truly realized complete freedom from conceptual contrivance. This happens because for a long time the meditator has been cutting through illusion and seeing emptiness as a kind of negation. This becomes such a strong habit that even when the experience of absolute reality the clear light nature of mind, starts to break through like the sun from behind clouds, the meditator automatically turns his mind towards it to subtly negate it. The Shentong argues that if there really were no conceptual contrivance in the mind the clear light nature would shine forth so clearly and unmistakably that it would not be possible to deny it. The fact that the Rangtong Mathyamikas do deny it, shows the importance of the third will of the doctrine. The Buddha is said to have turned the will of the doctrine, Dharma Kakra, three times. That is to say he gave three major cycles of teaching. The first corresponded to the Sravaka level of meditation on emptiness, the second to the Madhyamaka Rangtong level, and the third to the Madhyamaka Shentong. Each level of teaching remedies the faults in the level below it. Thus the Shentong regards the third will of the doctrine as remedying the faults in the second, the Madhyamaka Rangtong. The third will of the doctrine is explained in detail in the Tathagata Garbha Sutras and these are commented on in the Mahayana Tara Tantra Sastra, also known as the Ratnagatravibhaga, which in the Tibetan tradition is attributed to Maitreya. Here it is taught that the Tathagata Garbha pervades all beings and that the mind's nature is the clear light. These are two ways of saying the same thing. The classic examples given are those of butter in milk, gold in gold ore and sesame oil in sesame seeds. The butter, gold, and sesame oil pervade in the sense that when the milk, gold ore or sesame seeds are processed, the butter, gold and sesame oil emerge. In the same way beings go through a process of purification from which the purified Buddha nature, Tathagata Garbha, emerges. If the true nature, Dharmata, of beings were not the Tathagata Garbha they could never become Buddhas, in the same way that a rock that did not contain gold could never yield gold however much it were to be refined. Purpose of teaching the Tathagata Garbha The purpose of teaching the Tathagata Garbha is to give the meditator confidence that he already has Buddha nature. Without such confidence it is very difficult to fully rest the mind free from all conceptual contrivance, because there is always a subtle tendency to try to remove or achieve something. In the Ratnagatravibhaga five reasons are given for teaching the Tathagata Garbha. 
Firstly it encourages those who would otherwise be so self-depreciating that they would not even try to arouse bodhicitta and attain Buddhahood. Secondly it humbles those who, having aroused bodhicitta, feel intrinsically superior to others who have not. Thirdly it removes the fault of taking the stains, which are unreal, to be the true nature of beings. Fourthly it removes the fault of taking the clear light nature, which is real, to be unreal. Fifthly by showing that all beings are intrinsically of the same nature as the nature of Buddha, it removes the obstacle to the arising of true compassion, which sees no difference between self and other. Base Path and Fruit Since the Buddha nature is there from the beginning, it is present in the base path and fruit. The only difference between the three stages is that the base is the time when the Buddha nature is completely obscured by stains, the path is when it is partially purified and the fruit is when it is completely purified. The Doctrine of the Ratnagatravibhaga The Ratnagatravibhaga gives three points of Mahayana Buddhist doctrine that prove all sentient beings have Tathaga Ta Garbha. It lays out the doctrine on Tathaga Ta Garbha under ten headings and it gives the nine examples from the Tathaga Ta Garbha Sutra which illustrate how, although the Tathaga Ta Garbha remains unchanged, the veils have to be removed. It teaches three stages, the pure, the partly pure and the completely pure, which correspond to beings, bodhisattvas, and buddhas respectively. These correspond to the base path and fruit tathaga ta garbha. At first, an ordinary being does not recognize the clear light nature of his mind at all. It is therefore covered with both gross and subtle veils, this is the base tathaga ta garbha, which is like gold when it is still in the gold ore. Once the true nature of the mind has been recognized by the bodhisattva, the gross veils fall away. From then on the bodhisattva uses his realization as the essence of the path, which consists of refining it as one refines gold once it has been separated from the ore. The final realization is the fruit tathagat ta garbha and is like the perfectly refined gold that has all the qualities of pure gold. The fruit Tathagat Ta Garbha displays all the qualities of a perfectly enlightened Buddha. Ratnagatravibhaga 1.154 teaches that the element, i.e. the Tathagata Garbha, is empty of the contingent, stains, that are separable, since they are not of its essence, but not empty of the Buddha qualities that are not separable, since they are of its essence. The Buddha qualities are the qualities of the non-conceptual wisdom mind, which, when it is purified, is called the Dharma Kaya. When the wisdom mind is not purified the qualities are not manifest and it is called Tathagata Garbha. These qualities are the essence of that wisdom mind. They are not divisible from its essence as if the mind's essence were one thing and the qualities another. If they were like that they would have been shown to be empty of own nature by Madhyamaka reasoning. The essence would have arisen dependent on the qualities and the qualities dependent on the essence. Such qualities or such an essence could not have any self-nature or true existence. However, the Buddha qualities are not like this. They cannot be grasped by the conceptual mind and are not separable from the essence of the wisdom mind, which also cannot be grasped by the conceptual mind. Thus the Buddha qualities are not compounded or conditioned phenomena, which arise stay and perish. They exist primordially. The Shentong criticizes the view of the other Madhyamikas who say that the Buddha's qualities arise as a result of the good deeds, vows, and connections made by bodhisattvas on the path to enlightenment. If the qualities arose in this way then they would be compounded and impermanent phenomena, not beyond samsara and of no ultimate use to beings. The Shentong accepts the doctrine of the Tathagatagarbha sutras that the Buddha qualities are primordially existent. Nevertheless, good deeds, Vows and connections are necessary for removing veils. Both the Sittamatrins, and Rangtong Madhyamikas who have a philosophical view, think of the Buddha's wisdom as a stream of moments of purified awareness that has emptiness or the conceptionless nature as its subtle object. Since the object is pure, the awareness itself exhibits the qualities of a pure mind and this is called Jnana. Its arising is associated automatically with the qualities of the Buddha that result from the actions of the Bodhisattva on his path to enlightenment through his accumulation of wisdom and merit, punya. Therefore, whether they express this view explicitly or not, 
the Rangtong Mathyamikas who have a view regard the Buddha qualities as relative phenomena whose essence is emptiness. As has been mentioned already above, Shantong does not accept that the wisdom mind knows in a dualistic way. It does not divide into a knowing and a known aspect, so there is no subtle object of the wisdom mind. It is not a stream of moments of awareness. It is completely unbounded and free from all concepts including time and space. Therefore it is primordially existent like its qualities. The Doctrine of the Mahayana Sutra Lamakara This is another of the five treatises that the Tibetan tradition attributes to Maitreya. The Mahayana Sutra Lamkara teaches a distinction between the Dharman, the relative mind, and the Dharmata, the absolute clear light mind. Dharman is a general term that refers to that which has the particular quality under discussion. Dharmata means that which has the true nature. The relative mind is mistaken and confused, while the absolute mind is non-mistaken and non-confused. The relative mind faces out towards its object and has a perceiving and perceived aspect. It constitutes the stain that is to be given up. Its essence or true nature is the clear light mind. Thus the relative mind is the thing that is empty of something, Stongzi. It is empty of self-nature. Its real nature is the absolute clear light nature. According to Shantong the clear light mind in the Mahayana Sutra Lamkara is the same as the Tathagatagarbha in the Ratnagatravibhaga. The relative mind is what is referred to as the stains in the Ratnagatravibhaga. However the Ratnagatravibhaga does not explicitly say the true nature of the stains is the Tathagatagarbha. It just says they are empty of self-nature. Thus there is a slight difference in the layout, but the meaning is the same. The Doctrine of the Madhyanta Vibhaga This is another of the five treatises of Maitreya. This text is interpreted by Shantungpas as alluding to the following doctrine which is found clearly expounded in the Sandhin or Mokana Sutra. First. The three modes of existence, the second. The three modes of emptiness, the third. The three modes of absence of essence. First. The three modes of existence. The imaginary nature exists as mere conceptual creations. It is the objects that our concepts and ideas refer to. For example since the real tiger in a dream is non-existent, it is merely a figment of the imagination. In other words, the imaginary nature, which refers to the contents of the delusion rather than the delusion itself, exists only in the imagination as the referent of names and concepts. For example we talk about past events. These events do not exist at all. They are simply names or concepts for referring to things that are being imagined, but which do not exist. Objects external to the mind and senses are of this nature. They do not exist and yet names and concepts are applied to them. The dependent nature substantially exists, Rajasu Yod Pa, in the sense that it is not just imaginary in the above sense. Thus the thoughts, concepts, names, and ideas themselves, that appear both to the mind and in it, do actually occur. For example the dream tiger occurs and produces an effect, such as fear, in the dreaming mind. However, the dream tiger is only substantial in relation to the real tiger that is imagined to be there. It is not substantial in an absolute sense. From the Shentong point of view, it is not enough just to refute the true existence of the imaginary nature. The Shentong uses Madhyamaka reasoning to refute the true existence of the dependent nature as well as of the imaginary nature. The perfectly existent nature truly exists because it exists in a non-conceptual way. In the Sittamatra the perfectly existent nature is said to be mere emptiness, in the sense of freedom from the conceptual process of distinguishing outer perceived objects as different in substance to the inner perceiving mind. In the Shentong it is said to be the non-conceptual wisdom mind itself. It is indeed empty of the conceptual process of distinguishing outer perceived objects as different in substance to the inner perceiving minds. It is also empty of the conceptualizing process that creates the appearance of a divided consciousness, Vijnana, i.e. a stream of discrete moments of consciousness with perceiving and perceived aspects. It is completely free from any conceptualizing process and knows in a way that is completely foreign to the conceptual mind. It is completely unimaginable in fact. 
that is why it can be said to truly exist. To the three modes of emptiness. The imaginary nature is empty in the sense that it does not exist at all. It is the emptiness of something non-existent. The reference of names and concepts, the conceived objects themselves, never exist except in the imagination. They have no self-nature of their own, so they are said to be empty in themselves. Some Shentong masters say that the emptiness taught by the Rangtong is nothing more than this. In other words they do not regard it as being the ultimate emptiness taught by the Shentong. The dependent nature is empty in the sense of something existent, but not ultimately existent. In the relative it exists and functions, having its own characteristic. It is empty of the imaginary nature but not empty of itself. This is like the Sittamatra view. The Shentong interprets this to mean that in absolute terms the dependent nature does not exist at all. It is empty of self-nature because it is dependently arising. However, the appearance of the dependent nature is only possible because in essence all appearance is the mind's clear light nature and this does exist ultimately. The perfectly existent nature is the ultimate absolute emptiness. It is the non-conceptual wisdom mind, non-arising, non-abiding and non-perishing. It is primordially existent and endowed with qualities. It is empty in the sense that it is free from all the obscurations created by the conceptual mind. Therefore when the conceptual mind tries to grasp it, it finds nothing and so it experiences it as emptiness. Thus, it is empty to the conceptual mind, but from its own point of view it is the clear light nature of mind together with all its qualities. The third. The three modes of absence of essence. The imaginary nature is without essence in the sense that it does not exist according to its own characteristic. For example the imaginary fire does not have the characteristics of fire which is hot and burning. In the same way every phenomenon that is a conceived object of a concept does not exist with its own characteristic. The dependent nature is without essence in the sense that it never arises. Shentong refutes the existence of the dependent nature using Mathyamaka reasoning. The perfectly existent nature is absolute absence of essence in the sense that it is the absence of essence which is the absolute, in other words its essence is non-conceptual. The essence of the non-conceptual wisdom mind cannot be grasped by the conceptual mind and so, from the point of view of the conceptual mind, it is without essence, from its own point of view it is absolute reality. Non-conceptual Jainana Thus, according to the Shentong interpretation, the Ratnagatra Vibhaga, Mahayana Sutra Lamkara and Madhyanta Vibhaga all teach in different terms that the mind's true nature is the non-conceptual wisdom mind and that this is the ultimate absolute reality. As long as this is not realized the clear light nature acts as the basis for the impure, mistaken, or illusory appearances to manifest. In other words it is the basis for the manifestation of samsara. Once it is realized, it is the basis for pure manifestations, in other words the Buddha Kayas and Buddha realms, the mandalas of tantric deities and so on. The wisdom mind is both emptiness and luminosity at the same time. The emptiness expresses its non-conceptual nature and the luminosity expresses its power to manifest the impure and pure appearances. This is the view that links the sutras and the tantras. It is taught in the sutras of the third will of the doctrine and is the basis for all the tantric practices. The latter should be seen as special means for speeding up the realization process. In terms of the view, it is the same as that found in the sutras. Dream example When the dream was used as an example in the explanation of the other views, the emphasis was very much on the illusory nature of the dream appearances. From the Shentong point of view the comparison goes even further than this, because dreams quite clearly arise from the luminous quality of the mind itself. The mind itself can produce good and bad dreams and can continue a dream even after it has become aware that it is dreaming. Thus they can manifest whether the mind is unaware or aware. In the same way the clear light nature of mind is the basis for both samsara, which is when the mind is unaware of its own nature, and nirvana, which is when the mind is aware of its own nature. Whether the mind is aware or unaware of its own nature, that nature does not change. It is always empty of the imaginary and dependent natures. However, 
as long as the non-conceptual, non-arising wisdom mind is not recognized, the dependent nature seems to arise creating the dream manifestations that the confused mind imagines to comprise an outer world interacting with inner minds. From this confusion the idea of self and other, attachment and aversion, and all the other concepts and emotional disturbances arise. It is just like getting totally confused and involved in a dream. Once the awakened consciousness returns, however, one quickly sees the dreams as merely manifestations of the play of the mind, and whether they subside immediately or not, they do not disturb the mind at all. Method of Investigation The key to this method of meditation, or rather non-meditation, is held by those who have the realization themselves. Finally there is no substitute for personal instruction from a realized master who can, through his own skill and means on the one hand, and the faith and devotion of the disciple on the other, cause the realization to arise and mature in the disciple's mind. However, much can be done to prepare the mind and that is what this meditation progression on emptiness is designed to do. Gradually, by carefully practicing each stage in the meditation progression until some real experience of each level of realization has arisen in the mind, one's understanding deepens and the conceptualizing tendency loses its tight hold on the mind. Gradually the mind becomes more relaxed and open. Doubts and hesitations lose their strength and begin to disappear. The mind is naturally more calm and clear. Such a mind is more likely to respond readily and properly to the teacher's oral instructions. In Control's Encyclopedia of Knowledge, he says that the Rangtong is the view for when one is establishing certainty through listening, studying and reflecting. Shentong is the view for meditation practice. Meditation Procedure By the time one comes to meditation based on the clear light nature of the mind, the investigation stage of the practice has come to an end. All there is to do now is to rest the mind naturally in its own nature, just as it is without any contrivance or effort. As J. Amgon Kongtrul says in the section on Samatha and Vipassana in his Encyclopedia of Knowledge, whatever thoughts arise there is no need to try to stop them, in that state they simply liberate themselves. It is like waves on an ocean that simply come to rest by themselves. No effort is required to still them. Meditation can be done, as before, in sessions beginning with taking refuge and arousing bodhisattva, followed by dedication for the benefit of all beings. It can also be continued between sessions. From time to time one can stop what one is doing and rest the mind in its clear light nature, and then try to carry that awareness over into whatever one is doing. Generally speaking, however, when one first starts to meditate on the clear light nature of mind in the Shentong way, one's mind is far from being free of conceptual effort. Sometimes there will be the effort to see the emptiness of what arises, sometimes the effort to see the clear light nature, sometimes the effort to see them both as inseparable sometimes the effort to grasp the non-conceptual state, to understand it intellectually or to try to fix and maintain it somehow. Thus in the early stages one's meditation will not be a lot different from the early stages of the Sittamatra. This does not matter, since this is moving in the right direction. Knowing the different ways of meditating helps one to recognize the level of realization that one is approaching. Knowing the subtle faults of that level of realization helps one to overcome them.